All right. Hi, everyone. In my head, they came out with like Dr. Nick's voice. So I <laughs> Hi, say, everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, Are we up? Yeah. Hey, we're up. Um, we'll do some quick introductions and then we'll just launch right into this. But um, uh, you know who Steve is? Wasn't that like 20 minutes of the last show? <laughs> who Steve is? No. Actually, go ahead, sir. Sure. So I'm Steve from the Mac 84 YouTube channel, and I love repairing these things, tinkering around with them. And if you want to fall asleep to a very long live stream, well, my channel's the one for you. No, I, I do shorter videos too. One just released a few days ago, but uh, I, I just love these machines, love tinkering around with them and keeping them out of landfills. And uh, Ron shares a lot of my passions with that as well. It's true, it's true. Hi, I'm Ron McAdams. Um, my channel is called Ron's Computer Videos. You can probably find me on the Uptubs. Uh, I'm on Twitter, it's Ron Comp Vids. Uh, Ron's Comp Vids? Yeah, I probably ought to get my own Twitter handle, right? Uh, Ron's Comp Vids, uh, you can follow me for more information out on there. Um, I talked to Steve a while back about, hey, like what would be a fun thing to do at uh, VCF Midwest? And he said, a, Li a Lisa forum. Or like a Lisa panel. And I said, well, that's great, but I can't participate in that. And, he's, and I was like, well, what's the next best thing? I said, hey, let's talk about old Macintosh computers and how people can get involved in collecting them and uh, how collecting classic Mac, let me make sure I get my panel name right. Collecting classic Macintosh computers is for everyone. Yep. And it really is. So who here is a uh, Macintosh aficionado? I like this room. Great. Let's just go ahead and skip directly to the Q&A. And we will save all of ourselves quite a bit of time. Actually, no. Thank you very much for showing up. And I really do appreciate it. It's really great to see the Macintosh community kind of come together, see more and more people at VCF every year. Apple II, Macintosh, Lisa communities, Apple-like things, all that. It's good to see them all. So we'll, uh, we'll just launch right into this. Because we've got some goals that we want to try to accomplish with this. And if you read the uh, sort of the uh, word making, uh, the description of what the talk was going to be about out there on the VCF website, it kind of talks about it, it's, it's got some like bold goals uh, for a one hour panel. So what we decided to do is just scale things back a little bit. So that way that we could maybe try to hit the oldest machines because that's seemingly what people love. I saw what happened at the auction. Oh, $10 yeah. for a G5? Come on, folks. <laughs> but So I, I understand that not a lot of people feel nostalgia for some like the Intel era and the G5s and some of those like later, more like beige box, or not beige box, but kind of like corporate boxy looking maybe Max. So we'll talk about some of the older stuff. Does yep. that sound fair? That sounds great. All right, great. So who are we? Seems like we already covered this. <laughs> Those are our links. You could follow us. You could stalk us. You could send us donations. All that yeah. fun stuff. Look how good Steve looks in his picture. It's amazing. <laughs> Many years ago. Yeah, I know. My, yeah, I know. I, I know. It never changes. Mine, I look like I, uh, I either just got out of county or uh, I don't know what. But anyway, our goals for this are very simple. We're going to try to give everybody kind of uh, the tools that you're going to need to maybe get started in collecting cl classic Macintosh computers. Uh, we're going to try to break down those model years and those model lines so that way that maybe you guys can make some more informed decisions about what is actually collectible, what maybe appeals to you as a retro computing enthusiast, and uh, try not to overpay for things. I, I saw some amazing deals out there on the show floor today. I saw some people get away with some steals, but I think that that's also because this community that's been built here is very much interested in seeing other people succeed in this hobby. There, there are always gonna be people that are just out for the money, but I think that those are venues where there aren't these personal connections, that people aren't coming up and shaking each other's hands. Facebook Marketplace, eBay, uh, Craigslist, places like that maybe aren't as personal as these trans or these interactions that we have at events like this. So it's good to see amazing stuff. Uh, we're also gonna talk about repairs and upgrades that you're probably gonna wanna make on those new machines as you uh, pick them up. And then how to leverage online communities for uh, support and for ideas on how to make the best of your experience. And then we'll have a Q&A. And then the thing that I like best about any conference that I go to are the giveaways. I want free stuff. I don't know about you guys. So 
let's go ahead, everybody, under your t seats. <laughs> You're gonna have your timeshare materials. Let's go ahead and bring that up. Turn to page 58. Appendix Lisa, B. Lisa in the back, can you go ahead and get the financing <laughs> options available? Lisa, no, she's gone, okay. I don't know why this slide animated. <laughs> but anyway, we're in for a long presentation. We're in for a long presentation. And don't worry, Steve talks a lot in this one, but just not right up front. So what's in scope? Uh, we're gonna talk about Macintosh computers that were developed or produced by Apple between 1984 with the release of the original Mac 128, kind of up through the end of like the beige era, so 1999. So pre like relaunch with Steve Jobs with all of the, uh, the iMac kind of stuff. So what's out of scope? The slow ass slide. <laughs> Macintosh desktop computers produced by Apple after 1999. Macintosh clone computers, although I do love those machines. We're not gonna talk about portable computers, so like the PowerBook series. Uh, we're gonna leave the server products off because most people aren't gonna look for those. You're probably not gonna see those just out while you're collecting. And we're not probably gonna talk about Mac-like things. Mac-like things are like Newton, uh, some of the power CD accessories. Image things. writers. Yeah, we're not gonna talk about Steve's massive collection of Macintosh laser printers. Which, you know, if you just take him by his table, just drop him off, he loves them. No, thank you. So, what do we wanna expect? when we're uh, trying to collect these old machines, leaky caps, it's just gonna happen. Uh, exploding batteries, for sure. Um, get the batteries out of your old Macs. I don't care, you're wrong for leaving them in. Just get them out, you don't need them. You're gonna worry, or you're gonna need to uh, think about software, how you're gonna kind of find those things. Uh, bootable media, actually, it's you know horse and cart. How, I've got this download, how do I get it over to this machine? Uh, the fragile plastics, that are uh, notorious with certain areas of the machine. And on some of the machines, which pretty much everything we're gonna talk about is uh, proprietary accessories, because I think we're all sort of spoiled because you can just like, oh, I just grab this machine. I just plug a USB device in and away I go for uh, input devices. But ADB and stuff on the older Macs, it's tougher to find. A lot of people, especially when you get back into the really older machines, yep. you just don't have the accessories. All right. so. I'm gonna ask that everybody ignore the fact that ever, Apple never put this logo on a black background. Um, think different for a few minutes, and we'll go ahead and get started. Do you wanna take this one, Steve? Sure, so um, a lot of these Macs are the ones you've probably seen uh, around the show today, uh, and they are fantastic machines. They're compact, they're portable, they're easy to grab, easy to store, also easy to uh, throw away. Uh, so uh, a lot of these machines, um, well, there goes your water cap. A lot of these machines will, <laughs> uh, will have a, a number of issues that we're gonna be talking about today, but uh, the 128K, the 512K, and the Macintosh uh, Plus uh, all share uh, one thing that is very important because if you're grabbing that machine and you don't have the keyboard or the mouse, you're sort of out of luck because those those keyboards and those mice uh, were only, with the exception of the mice, because they were on other products, but the keyboard especially is the really expensive part of this thing. I mean. That keyboard, if it's not included with the machine, you're gonna you know, have to hack together your own adapter for another modern keyboard or something like that. And the keyboard is sometimes worth way more than the computer itself. So that's the thing you have to be aware of. Um, analog boards and these things, you also have to be aware of that's what drives the video circuitry. And a lot of the times these machines were on for ages and ages and ages, and they could leak, and you could have all this lovely corrosive goo on the analog board and not even know about it. Um, failing flyback transformers, what drives the CRT, uh, tired displays, out of focus displays, things like that. Uh, you just want to be aware of this stuff. And, you know, although you may find one in great condition, uh, you may find, a, I think you have a fantastic deal on it, do not settle. There are so many of these that were sold, so many people that have these that want to rehome them, that if you find one and the guy's like, no, it's, it's going to be X amount and that's the way it's going to be, don't worry about walking away because something like that is uh, just, you know, an accident waiting to happen of you just dumping money into it and never recovering. <laughs> yep. So the early Macintosh machines, uh, so talking about the Mac 128 with the original machine, kind of up through the end with the Mac Plus, kind of the original Macs that launched. Um, 120K, again, you'll never guess how much RAM it has. Um, but none of these drives have internal storage or anything like that, so you're going to need good floppy drives. You have to also keep in mind that all these original machines have single-sided floppy drives, low-density floppy drives, 400 kilobyte floppy drives.
floppy drives. That's really tough these days, outside of having a floppy disk emulator, to be able to produce media for those things. If you have a newer Mac, you can use as a bridge machine. You might be able to configure some of these devices or some of these machines, but it's tough. So I would say the 128, the 512K, 512KE means that it has the same ROM chip and the same uh, floppy disk controller as the Mac Plus. Yep. So it does support double-sided 800K floppies. But these machines are largely curiosities at this point. They look great on a shelf, especially if you can kind of pair them with the appropriate keyboard and mouse. Um, this machine that's actually showing right here, that's actually showing kind of a beta, ver or like the kind of the, not really a beta version of the Mac operating system, but sort of like the proof of concept things for some of the stuff they wanted to accomplish or wanted to do uh, with the early operating system. But the 128, the 512K, 512KE come with that smaller keyboard that does not include the um, keypad. So if you want to absolutely make sure your stuff is paired, you're going to have to find that smaller keyboard. Those are even tougher to find than the Mac Plus keyboard, which does include a, a keypad by default. But they are compatible. So you know, yes. if you don't matter about aesthetics or anything like that, you can use it. And there are some uh, adapters that you could build and stuff like that. But you know, that's probably not why you want a complete one. You want it to look correct, etc. Sure. Now, Steve, let me ask you: a Mac Five or a, sorry, a Mac XL? Um, would you buy any one of these for anything other than just a collector's item? What is a Mac XL? Probably not. <laughs> yeah. No, the the Mac XL is you know the rebadged Lisa two, and if you were here you know 20 minutes ago, mm -hmm. you you just caught the end of our Lisa presentation. But um, yeah, the Mac XL is a, is a great machine. It's very interesting, but um, I wouldn't use it as a Mac. It's a poor <laughs> Macintosh because all the rest of these are eight megahertz, 68,000 microprocessors. The Mac XL is the same chip that's in the Lisa, which is a five megahertz, 68,000. So you not only have the world's slowest Mac. It's also, it's very big, it's very hot, and um, it's got, it, it doesn't have the same sound chip, it's got rectangular pixels, it has a lot of limitations. Well, now, so, now I want it even more. I know you do. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, these machines are very much curiosities. Pick them up and you can't put it on a shelf, they look great. Yeah, People and, will and ask you, you lots of questions. You can swap out parts, so if you get one dead one, don't be afraid, there's plenty of tutorials online of, oh, this analog board fits in this machine, et cetera, this CRT can be swapped. You could all do it, it's just how much you want to invest your time and money in. Right. Highly collectible, don't break the bank. Um, Matt had one for thirty dollars, a Mac 128, just the machine, at last year's event. So there are a lot of people that just want to unload them. They don't really care. Don't spend four or five hundred dollars. Just don't do it. So, kind of the series that came after that. You have the early Macintosh 2 machines. Um, this is kind of after Steve Jobs' departure. Um, because that, it has expandability. Yes, <laughs> because these are the first Macs that give you all the things that Steve didn't want you to have. So you have expandability in the form of new bus slots, which are basic, it's like Apple, uh, Apple very much likes to take some other standard and kind of twist it a little bit. They're, they're very much the, the, the Sauron of, uh, of this universe. I, that's totally an end up like a meme. But um, they, uh, they very much like took ISA and they're like, we're gonna tweak this a little bit. We're gonna make kind of our own little deal. And that's where you get new bus from. So the, um, which is the interconnect for expansion slots. Right, you so sure. your, your slots, basically. You have the 2, the 2X, and the 2FX. These are kind of the early machines. And basically, you get like, it's not really speed boosted. These are all 68020 68 machines, um, except for the 2FX, which is like a 40 megahertz, yeah. 68030. So it's a very, very fast machine. But lots of expandability but also lots of issues. Yeah, and so these machines, and, and just going back to the previous generation for a second, all of those Macs, the clock battery or the PRAM battery is on the back, there's a little door, you could just remove the battery. Yeah, it may have leaked, it may have messed up the analog board, you could easily remove it. These machines, yeah, you can, but some of them, the batteries were soldered onto the logic board. So in the Mac world, we call the motherboard a logic board, but they were soldered onto it. So not all the revisions of these machines have soldered on batteries, some of them do. And in most cases, those batteries are required to jumpstart the circuitry to make the machine boot up. Now, there are some workarounds, you can hot wire it, you can put some, you know, D cell batteries and wired in all that stuff. But these, these are some of the rare exceptions where you do need some battery power in these machines. If you're gonna replace those batteries, you know, if you're gonna store that machine, even if it's a new battery, take it out, 
um, a lot of these machines that I see, severe battery damage. And uh, that is something that unfortunately uh, claims the life of many of these systems. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's just yeah. something that and hurts. And it's not just bad. Batteries are bad, quote me. Uh, <laughs> and, and don't at me. But uh, the, the 2 and the 2X and the 2FX, they all have two clock batteries on the board. Yes. Some many soldered, many, many there was an aftermarket upgrade that Apple did that actually made them kind of in a battery holder like later Macs have. Uh, so they're easily removed and swapped out and things like that. But it, you just have to put it in a warm place and forget about it. And now you've destroyed your machine. Um, but if you were to pick anything out of the series, like a 2 or a 2X is probably an, a, a cool curiosity machine, very, very expandable, lots of fun things you can do with it. A 2FX is a little more finicky because those machines have, um, uh, they have special requirements for their SCSI termination. Yeah. They also uh, require special RAM. So they use a 64 pin PAL SIM instead of like a 30 pin SIM kind of on those other machines. So it's, there are starting to be key, um, modern reproductions for the RAM, so that's pretty easy to find, but, or will become easier to find as time goes on. But still, the SCSI Terminators and things like that, if, it, if you don't have that from yeah. back in the day, it's tough to get that now. And, and if you're working on a Mac, be prepared for SCSI Voodoo, because no matter how you think you have your drives configured, you have it configured wrong. Mm -hmm. And just do it again, you'll be fine. Um, one thing I do want to mention about mm -hmm. the Mac 2 and some of these in the series, uh, just like some of the previous machines where you had different uh, capacities of floppy drives, some of the Mac 2s have been upgraded with the ROM chips and the floppy controller chip to support the 1.4 meg drives, but most of these will only support 800K drives unless that upgrade has been done or it's a later model, et cetera. So again, you want to just keep things in mind. You want to know as much about these machines as possible before you pick it up. Do not assume, oh, I could use you know 1.4 meg floppy and write da data to it. No, you probably need an older 800K drive, and with that, you need an older Mac that works. It's like a bridge machine, like an LC or a G3 or something like that, that could act actually write those disks on an Apple branded floppy drive, you know, so these machines can boot up or you get a, a modern equivalent, which we'll talk about later, like a blue SCSI or a floppy MU, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But uh, just, you, you just want to, you know, fully understand what you're getting into before you even think about purchasing one of these. So you're not disappointed later on, like, oh, I got to spend a hundred dollars just to get this thing to boot, you know? Right. If you were to pick any of these machines, Steve, what would, which one would you kind of pick? 2FX. I, I agree. It's it's a fast machine. It's a lot of fun. But I would I would say that if you were looking for something inexpensive to try to play around with a Macintosh 2 color machine, because these machines do require a new bus video card, yep. new bus network. Yeah, card, no onboard video. They, yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> That's of That's why you have you, six slots. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff you have to purchase to kind of make them usable. So I would not spend more than a hundred bucks. Which, yeah, is I mean, that a fair? the 2FX could be a very desirable machine, mm -hmm. but if it's loaded, if it's recapped, if it get, and the power supply, hmm, those mm -hmm. are fun. Yeah. Somebody in the audience had one explode and catch on fire. But, yeah, fun I'm, times. I'm cheap. I'm cheap, Steve. So <laughs> I, I don't want to spend, I ain't going to pay a lot for this Macintosh. So, um, there, and then, sorry. Go oh, ahead. yeah. You want to do this one? No, yeah, sure. Okay. So um, the second generation of Compact Macs, and they're called that because they're compact, um, these machines are really great. Uh, the SE, the SE FDHD, uh, the SE30 is a very, very big fan favorite. Classic, classic too. I would generally say you really can't go wrong with these machines. Um, they have a lot of capabilities built into them. Uh, you do have to worry about uh, a lot of things that we talked about before, capacitors, batteries, especially in the SE30, and we'll talk about that in a little mm -hmm. second. But um, just a heads up here, the SE could only have, uh, due to the floppy controller chip and everything, could only really understand the 800K disks. So you're still limited on that. However, the SE FDHD, sometimes also branded as the SuperDrive model, can handle the 1.4 meg disks that Max afterwards could do. So uh, the same goes for the SE30, the Classic, and the Classic too. Um, these machines are great. The SE um, has an expansion slot, unlike the previous Compaq Max. Uh, the SE30 also has an expansion slot, which is different from the SE, so don't buy a card for one and expect the other. I know, silly things. Um, the SE and the SD, uh, SE FDHD, uh, these are more commonly found. Um, if you see a, a Macintosh SE that's not an SE30, but it has a number on it like uh, 1 slash 40 or something like that, I'm forgetting all of them, just, just remember, that's not an SE30. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a rebranded SE for a different market. Uh, that was telling you the capacity of the memory and the hard disk, et cetera. Uh, the SE30 are very desirable because you could shove a lot more memory in them. 
Uh, they could take uh, these these rare upgrade cards. I could shove a, a 68040 into it and color output and Ethernet and all this stuff. Some of that can be done in the SE, but the SE30 is a much more desirable machine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The and there are some RAM limitation, limitations on the SE and the classic models. I think it's four megabytes. Yeah. Those are both 68,000 microprocessors. They're both at eight megahertz. The uh, SE FDHD. Uh, is also 68,000, 8 megahertz. It's still limited to 4 megabytes of RAM. The SE30 has a maximum of 128 megabytes of RAM. Try and use it all. Yeah, it's 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 kind of painful though too because the SE30 will do a ROM check or a RAM check on startup, and it's checking all of your RAM. So go <laughs> make grow, a cup of coffee, grow the coffee beans, <laughs> process them, and then right eventually by the time you and Juan Valdez are on first name basis, your machine will be booted. Um, classic and Classic 2, or I'm sorry, Classic 2 is a 68030 at 16 megahertz, but it has kind of the limitations of some of the later machines we'll talk about, that it 10 megabytes of RAM, so it does kind of limit your usability with certain versions of System 7 and all that. Yeah, and, and for all these machines, you just want to also think to yourself, like, what is my goal here? What, what applications do I want to want run? What system software do I run, mm -hmm. want to run? Uh, there's a lot of things that you just have to mentally think about and say, OK, well, if I'm going with system six, you know, I don't need color. I don't need this. I don't need that. What's your goal? Because it, it can be very easy to get one of these machines and then realize, oh, I can't play the games I want to do. I can't do this. I can't do that. Will it play Crisis, Steve? <laughs> yes, all of these can oh. play Crisis. Quote me oh on that gosh. and subscribe. Thank um, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think um, you know the classic and the classic two. Um, these machines will always need a recap. Um, just talking about the repair capabilities of these things. The logic board for the SE, the SE FDHD, which is you know just the SE board and, and with a floppy a disk high density guys. <laughs> Sorry, Apple, yes, that's Apple what it means. Apple really slid one past us. Yeah. So the the SE board uh, has really you know a slim chance of. Uh, being plagued by the capacitor issues. There are axial caps on there. They don't tend to leak as badly. Uh, the SE30 is a whole other story. That's a minefield. I've had one on my desk for like a month of like daily you know, inspection under a microscope and I still couldn't find out what was yeah. going on. Classic and, classic uh, and Classic 2 have battery leakage yeah. problems, cap yeah. leakage problems. You can clean the boards up. Everything will look like it's working. You'll have no sound and it's because you have hidden shor shorts from the electrolytic uh, fluid underneath sound chips shorting things out, you have all kinds of issues. Someone so. handed me a board today who's in this room that their, their machine has no sound and it's likely because of that. Um, yeah, so just be, be knowledgeable about these machines, do your research, just try and figure that out. We're trying to share little bits and pieces of information. We have a lot to cover right. today. Yeah. But it, essentially, you wanna make sure that these machines uh, are what you expect them to be. Open them up, don't be afraid, take out the logic board, inspect it. If the battery exploded, it'll be very apparent. You'll see a lot of rust. Right. And uh, if the capacitors have leaked, you'll see a lot of sticky fuzz, looks like hair, stuff like that. Um, I would generally recommend that, you know, if you're going to get one of these things, ask for pictures. They're not going to give you pictures. Have them open it up. If you're not going to do that, move on. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody, let some other fool buy it. Uh, these machines are quite plentiful, uh, with the exception of some of them. But, you know, either one of these is a good pickup. Uh, just be aware of the condition of them. Absolutely. Okay. The LC series, which um, stand buckle up, stands for low cost color. I guess they want to call it LCC. But anyway, the LC series is um, Apple trying to get a Mac 2 type machine in terms of like features without the expandability into the education department and into people's homes. Uh, the original LC basically has the same specs as the um, uh, kind of the Mac 2X, so it's it's you've got color, you've got up to uh, I think 10 megabytes of RAM due to some jiggery pokery that Apple did with 32-bit um, processors on 24-bit buses, or and or I think that's correct. But um, the original LC is a 68020, 16 megahertz. It's not great. Uh, it's basically like that kind of that original Mac 2, but with uh, high-density floppy support. They tried to correct some of those things with the LC2. Uh, it is a 16 megahertz 030. It ain't a squirt faster than the LC. Um, 
But, but it has a two in the name. Yeah, it sure does. Sure makes that new model year ring a lot prettier than uh, just saying we're back at it. Uh, the LC3 is actually a, a really nice machine, and it uh, makes some big strides. It's a uh, 25 megahertz 68030. Uh, you now have the ability, or you now have 72 pin SIMs, so you've got 32 bit memory on 32 bit bus on a 32 bit processor. So that way that uh, there's no artificial little speed bumps that you're gonna hit on the machine. Uh, it's really great. I can't speak uh, highly enough about it. Uh, I think the max RAM, you've got four megabytes on the motherboard, you can add a 32 pin or 32 meg SIM, 36 megabytes. That's lots of breathing room for System 7 on these machines. Um, they did a speed bump model in certain markets. It's called the 3 Plus. The 3 Plus is basically a 33 megahertz uh, 68030. And you can perform that upgrade at home. It's, I think it's moving one resistor or something yep. that just says, hey, we're over here now. Um, you will have to modify your system software and stuff like that just to make sure that that it does support the Gestalt code, which on Macintoshes is basically like, hey, I'm a this type of computer. So that way that the operating system will quickly report things about it in uh, for tech step, yep. for Apple diagnostic stuff. And then also when you go to about this Macintosh, that'll say the proper thing. Yeah, because the, the Mac is, is very different from PC. There's no BIOS or anything like that. So you can't configure that thing before the machine starts up. So it's all software based and, and trickery with that, it, with some of these machines that are similarly uh, named <laughs> from a naming convention. And then kind of capping off the original LC series, which it came a couple years after that, uh, is the LC-475, also known as the Quadra 605. It was Apple's uh, attempt to kind of bring that later Quadra 68040 uh, technology back down into the LC series, so you get that back into education, uh, through the Performa series, get that out into retail uh, outside of like Apple stores and things. Those are really great machines, but they do have a big problem with uh, battery bombs where uh, you'll, it'll be, it worked the last time I turned it on. <laughs> when was the last time we turned it on? Oh, my kids were in high school. <laughs> Wait a minute, aren't you in your 80s? <laughs> it's, you know, situations like that. So you definitely have to watch those machines. But I would say that, that the, the LC3, LC475 or Quartz 605, they're great spec machines. I think they're very collectible just because if you want a pizza box that has decent specs, that's gonna be a fun machine to play on. Play like some of those color games that came out kind of in the, the late Mac 2 era, Prince of Persia, stuff like that. It'll play yeah. it wonderfully. Uh, Price-wise, I probably would not spend more than 150 bucks for like a LC-475, uh, LC-3, 75 to $100 maybe, yeah. if, it, if it was in pretty good condition. So, and, and a lot of these you could pick up for much less than that. Obviously. Oh yeah, I'm just saying kind of the outside scope. Like I wouldn't, yeah, don't break the bank on some of this now, with, stuff with, because with the all deals of, are out there. With some of these machines, uh, a battery is required for you to see video output uh, or for it to chime correctly. A lot of them are very cranky in the, their old age. I believe it's specifically the, uh, what's it? The, series. The, uh, I think one of the LC, I think it's the LC2 or something like that. You could correct us later in the comments. Yeah. Uh, but is, essentially. <laughs> we're, um, we're, it, like anybody that's on a panel here, people are very, very knowledgeable about things, yeah. but it, that, that encyclopedic knowledge sometimes gets tripped. <laughs> so. so, but uh, one thing I just want to mention is sometimes you'll get one of these machines or someone's demoing it to you and it may seem dead. Now, mm -hmm. it may not be dead. You may have to put a little bit of work into that. The power supplies on these are known for going. Um, there's what we call the capacitor forest, which is by the PDS slot in the corner of this machine right by the sound chip where all those caps love to leak and they're little forested capacitors and that's a nightmare to try and fix. So do not uh, overpay for some of these machines, especially in the condition. They're so easy to open the lid. You could break the plastics, obviously, you gotta be careful, but they're so easy to pop the top, take a look at, even a novice can do it, even somebody on eBay could do it. So you just wanna make sure that uh, you get good pictures and there's often some goodies hiding in that PDS slot, like an Apple IIe card. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you see a weird card in the back, just don't ask questions, say, oh yeah, here's yeah. here's 20 bucks. Looks just great, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Because that 100 bucks you spent on that machine, you might have a, a $200 a uh, lapis video card or something crazy that somebody stuck in there and forgot about. Uh, something else that Steve was talking about, the capacitors, every one of these machines, you're gonna re you're gonna have to recap them. Yeah, That's, it's not it's not all, a it's not a, a when it's not an if <laughs> yeah. it's not a when I get around to yeah. it. If you really want to use it and have it be stable, it's something you're gonna have to do. Yeah, you, you might like turn it on. You hear weird whining from the speaker, like radio tunes, mm -hmm. like 
shortwave radio type stuff, yeah, that's a capacitor is going wee. So yeah, you want to remove those. Oh, yep. So uh, these are fun. These are highly collectible because people love a compact Mac that is color. All the, the previous compact Macs with the screens, black and white. Um, so these were color. Uh, they were a bit compromised on the speed when they came out. They were a bit you know, panned by some of the critics um, because they're not the fastest machines. Um, but the Color Classic, the Classic 2, um, the Color Classic 2 rather, these are, are machines that uh, go for pretty good dollars. Um, they are not without their problems. Uh, thankfully, uh, although it you know, is a compact machine, it was one of the first ones where the logic board just slides out. There are these little plastic tabs. You open that up, the logic board comes out on a tray and there's an edge card connector so you could easily pull it out, inspect it, put it back in. You don't have to go anywhere near the CRT circuitry to do that. That being said, a lot of these have analog board issues. You do have to have them recapped if the machine is not powering on correctly. Thankfully, this one does have a green LED on the front to tell you if the machine's getting power, but they are soft power. So you have to push the key on the keyboard in order to boot the machine up. And a lot of people who are selling these go, yeah, I can't turn it on, I don't have the keyboard, or they don't even know that, and they think, oh yeah, it's dead. So you just wanna go in with that knowledge, knowing that you, know, you do have to have the keyboard to try and properly boot one of these things up. Um, they can be upgraded. You can put all sorts of different, uh, you know, uh, Performa LC 500 series boards in there. And people have done some very crazy modifications to make these mystic upgrades and stuff like that. You could just uh, find out so much more about that online. But I think what is more appealing about these, it's a compact machine. It was color. Yes, the resolution was limited. Um, you know, there are hacks to get around that. But it's just one of those iconic machines, and uh, you don't really see them all too often in the wild. I haven't seen one here today that wasn't for sale. You know, yeah. maybe one on display. But. Maybe, yeah. But uh, the Color Classic is a uh, 16 megahertz, 68030. It's basically a Macintosh LC2, kind of in this smaller form factor. The uh, Color Classic 2 is basically a LC3 kind of in this smaller board form factor. And like Steve was saying, Apple did release some Performa models where you can just directly pull the board out and swap it out. And that's exactly what they did in uh, Japan with the Color Classic 2. They took the motherboard from a Performa 550 and put it in that board so you had a speed bump machine that maybe better addressed and kind of extended the life on being able to put those machines out. This is also one of the first Macs that had a interchangeable uh, nameplate on the front. So you'll often see people that have like European models that'll be the color classic with a U. Um, and then you'll see the, in, in Japan that the, they'll have the little swap the thing and it'll say color classic two on it as well. Yeah, and th these machines are great because they, they you know, serve that purpose of having a small Mac, but like the previous LC ones, uh, they are expandable. There's one expansion slot called the PDS processor direct slot. Uh, so you can basically choose your upgrade of choice, you know, whether you want Ethernet or an Apple IIe card or something like that. Just be aware that's those LC machines and the machine like this, they're limited on expandability. There's a few modern ways to get around that, but you know, just FYI. Right, if you're trying to stick in kind of that classic era. Then you have the late Macintosh 2 machines. You have the Mac 2CX, 2CI. This is a 2SI up here, which is kind of a compromised Mac. The 2VI, which probably just needs to be launched directly into space. <laughs> and the 2VX. Um, these are all 68030 machines. Um, I think the 2CI is 16 megahertz. The 2SI is 16 megahertz. Uh, CX, uh, VX are both 25 megahertz 68030s. Uh, the VI, the less said about it, the better. It's, so, it's a crippled sort of model that Apple put out uh, to maybe try to extend the life on some and things. it wasn't sold in this country, right? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't sold in the U.S., so the chances you're going to run across one are pretty pretty low. If you find one, send it to me. I just want the badge. <laughs> yeah. This is kind of from the era where Apple um, did make some pretty big mistakes in terms of like architecture, like on the 2SI. The, um, you have... Uh, like the, the VRAM is on the board, so you've got built-in video on a lot of these things, but they'll use the slowest RAM in the system. If you're familiar with Amiga, you've got like fast RAM and, and slow RAM and things like that. And just how the processor uh, uh, addresses things. The, the 2SI, it's like it addresses the RAM as slow as you can. I remember I went to a friend's house and I was like, why do you have like, your disk cache set to like one megabyte? And he goes, oh, so it uses the slow onboard RAM 
for the cache and you use your actual RAM expansion for like running programs and things like that. And it improved the speed of the machine considerably. So I was like, wow, that's a, like a cool hack. Yeah. And, but unfortunately, you shouldn't have to do things like that. These things cost as much as a car. Yeah. So why, you know, why, why would we, why would we put up with these things? So uh, just quickly, the 2CX does not have onboard video. You need a Nubus video card to get any video out of that machine. Just FYI, the 2CI does have onboard video. Uh, the 2SI, uh, well, the 2CX and the 2CI have three Nubus expansion slots. So on the 2CX, you're going to use one for video. The 2SI has one PDS slot that's unique to it. So what you have to do is if you want an expansion card, you either buy a specific card that was made for that, or you could buy a PDS to Nubus adapter that Apple made. Again, some of these things are getting hard to find. But just want to keep in mind as far as expansion goes, if you want to do stuff at Ethernet and things that weren't in these machines you know, when they were sold on board, you have to think about expandability. The 2VI, 2VX, basically the same board. Uh, so there are Nubus expansion card slots there. Yeah. Um, and the 2CX and 2CX are notable for having startup circuitry issues because they use soft power and the caps like to leak and damage that. So if you get one of these machines and it doesn't boot up right away, you're obviously going to need some repairs and stuff. But, you know, it's it's not the end of the world. It's just one of those things you have to be aware of. Yeah. 2SI especially, more, more limitations yes. on that. Um, and the power supply on have, that is terrible. Yes, even if you, and then if you also have that PDS to new bus adapter, you're limited to seven inch new bus cards. And most of the best stuff that you're going to encounter for new bus are 12 inch cards. So it's like saw off the front of your machine or just, you know, I contemporary to that, put it on AOL sales <laughs> forum or something, just get rid of it, make it somebody else's problem. Oh yeah, the, these are great. So the, the early Quadra series, these were like Apple's business machines, more expensive. Um, the, the Quadra 700 has a very similar case to the 2CI and the 2CX. Only two new bus slots, but had very fast uh, video on board. Uh, the Quadra 900, 950, <clears throat> I don't have too much physical experience with this. I just got a 950 yesterday, so I'll learn more. But uh, you, you played around with a few of them, I think, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the 700 is really great because it's kind of the same form factor as like the 2CX, 2CI board. So you can actually, that's something to definitely make sure uh, that somebody did not sell you a Quadra 700 case that has a 2CI or 2CX motherboard that's been swapped into that. Uh, but everybody wants a Quadra 700 and why do they want a Quadra 700? Jurassic Park, <laughs> right. So the price on those has gone crazy. The other thing that's really nice about those is they have tandem caps on the motherboard of the Quadra 700. So you typically don't have to recap them. Power supply, yes. Motherboard, not as often. Uh, but the Quadra 900 and 950 are very fragile machines, just in terms of not just plastics, but just like the board and stuff. Yeah. There's a bajillion uh, caps on those things that need to be addressed. And so even if you have them up and running, there's always something it's, it's like the car your dad is always tinkering with. That it's like, it's never going to run. I feel seen. It's uh, it's never going to run. Um, but but the, this, uh, not to cut you off, no, but the, uh, please. the uh, 700, the 2CI, and the 2CX, I just want to let you know, the battery is located in a spot that you cannot usually see from photos on eBay. So you want to look at like a diagram or the service manual to see where the battery is. And the 2CI and 2CX, it's under the hard drive. I believe on the Quadra 700, it's in the roughly the same spot, but you just want to make sure that that battery has not leaked because if that has exploded, you know, the value of that has just dropped significantly and hey, it's a parts board. You could desolder a chip off of that and you know, put it on a keychain. but yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the batteries are always going to be a problem in these machines across every series all the way up even to some of the new stuff until they switch to the... Yeah, these were socketed thankfully, yeah. but you know, still. Yeah. Um, Centris, <laughs> uh, the Apple, yeah, exactly. That was what I thought too. I was like, Centris. But uh, Apple very briefly was like, I, I don't know if there was probably like a boardroom meeting because people didn't smoke big stogies. It's not like watching the Hutsucker proxy, but it's like, you know, what we got to do is we got to, you know. So they, they were like, well, we got these Quadra machines and that's kind of, we're aiming that at business customers, but we'd also like to be able to maybe sell a slightly downgraded version that we could sell to prosumers, small office kind of stuff. So what they did is where you have a, like what you'll see in a minute as a Quadra 610, they had a Centra 610. So it's a 25 megahertz, 68040 Motorola processor that was lacking in FPU. So you could sell the slightly cheaper version of the chip, configure the machine exactly the same, knock a couple hundred bucks off the, um, uh, the asking price, 
and then hopefully kind of slide that into a Comp USA or a Montgomery Ward or something like that, and uh, and make some extra sales on that. The the 660 Centra 660 AV, if you have one of those, just hold on to it because they produce that's in the thousands. That's like just like a stopgap weird yeah, machine that they made for just a little while. Um, Centra 650 very much kind of uses the same case as like the Mac 2 VX, Mac 2 VI, and then you'll later see that on some Power Mac models in the future. But these are these are okay machines, but they're compromised. Um, if you have an application that you're going to uh, play around with that absolutely would benefit from having a floating point unit, Mathco, um, don't buy a Centris. Uh, or and definitely if you have a Centris and somebody says, well, I think they upgraded the processor. Don't ask them to check, <laughs> because asking them to check means they're getting out the biggest flat blade screwdriver they have in their collection, and they're gonna love to just wiggle that processor, or the heatsink off, and it doesn't matter. They'll jam, the, they'll scratch the board, they'll do everything else. I saw a post about that recently where they somebody was having them check, and they were like, "Well, it wasn't the thing," and then I bought it, and then they killed it, and now I have no money to buy my the Mac <laughs> I wanted, and it's just like, wow. Sometimes you just got to be a cautionary tale for other people, I suppose. Well, the, the, the 650 has tantalum caps, which is great, so you don't really worry about that leaking, and power supply is a different issue. Uh, the 2VX, very similar to the same case. These are the first Macs with the CD-ROM drive that was available built in. Mm -hmm. So you have a second uh, bay there, which is great. If you want to add optical drive or a SideQuest drive or something like that, you can. Who needs the faceplate? You know, it just adds character, I yeah. guess. But you can and and you, know, you know how like the motherboards have to be recapped. CD-ROM drives. Yeah. Who'd have thunk? You got to recap your CD-ROM drive. I didn't know. I didn't know. I just amassed a huge collection of them, so when right. one stops working, I just grab another. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm going to do until the end of time. <laughs> so the 605 is, uh, is, is one that we talked a little bit about before, like a, a rebranded LC with a bit a different processor in there. Uh, the Centra 610 and the Quadra 610, no, you're not imagining things. They are identical, pretty much. Uh, there were different configurations, slightly different processors that were put in there. But it's in the, the picture that you see there, these large, extra large piece of uh, box max. That's what you're going to be expecting. Quadra 650, same one as a Centra 650, slightly different processor configuration. Same goes for a lot of these on the list. Uh, with the exception of the Quadra 800, which was a mini tower design that was the first one uh, that they designed that in and uh, gives you more expandability and so on and so forth, a lot of more RAM and stuff like that. Uh, that was a 33 megahertz 68040, so pretty speedy chip. And the bane of my existence, Quadra 840 AV. So I picked one up, I think around 2007, 2008 for five whole dollars. And it ran beautifully up until, I don't know, about half a decade ago, when it just you know, stopped working. And uh, about five years later, I got some life out of it. Not 100%, but it's kind of working. Uh, there's a lot of uh, digital signal processors on this machine, a lot of AV in and out capabilities built onto the board. Very cutting edge, a very desirable machine, just because it's an oddball. It has a lot of this cool stuff built in. Ethernet networking, S-video and composite video in and out, digital audio, 40 megahertz, 68 LC, um, 68 040, full, uh, not a LC one. Uh, just one of these machines that if you see it, and if it's at a good price, uh, even the bezel is worth <laughs> a good amount of money, you know, even the plastic of it. Yeah. Uh, the, there's another asterisk by the Quadra 630 because that kind of marks a change in uh, kind of the design on these things. They went to uh, kind of a smaller box and they switched to IDE drives, which uh, kind of have some performance issues. People don't really care for the Quadra 630. They don't really care for like some of the Power Macintosh 6200s and stuff that kind of make use of that same form factor and same technologies. But we'll talk more about that here in a second. I know that we're kind of going long on time here, so we're probably gonna hit the, hit the gas here. A little bit to get through some of these. You have the uh, all-in-one LC series, which uh, we kind of talked about the Performa 550 and things like that. But when you see LC, there was a point where Apple shifted. These are more for education customers and for people that were actually going into real Apple stores and buying these machines. But the all-in-one machines you see here, they have a 14-inch, uh, or is it 14 or a 13-inch Atom? Uh, the uh, <laughs> Sony Trinitron display, so they're very sharp. Um, and uh, basically quadra level 
uh, guts. Do not ship these machines. Do not pay to have them shipped. Yeah. We'll get a bundle of broken parts. Right. 520, 550, those are both 68030s. I think both are 33 megahertz. The LC575, which is the very desirable one here, probably on the list, 68040 LC, so no math coprocessor, 25 megahertz. The LC580, that's very much kind of like that Quadra 630, where it's using that kind of modified motherboard with IDE that also has a cheaper display. It's a Sanyo or something. So whereas the uh, Sony, or the, I'm sorry, those others had a very flat Sony display, it's, it's very bowed, the, the Sanyo displays. Um, Macintosh TV avoided all cost because it is, it's neat looking. It's a version of this. It's completely black, black keyboard, black mouse. That means more expensive accessories to try to find. Uh, but the, it is like an LC inside. Max of eight megs of RAM. Yeah, it's like a 16 megahertz, 68030. It doesn't do much of anything other than be like a television that you could also have a really compromised Macintosh experience with. And all these machines, like the Color Classic, the logic boards slide out from the back. So if you're inspecting one of these, take a look in the back. You can see if the battery's in there, et cetera. Some of these use the little cube batteries from Rayovac uh, instead of the uh, you know half size double A's. But yeah, just something to note. Yeah, those are tougher to find. And too. soft power as well. So you need a keyboard to turn those on. So early Power Macs, uh, these are fun, but you know it, it really depends on what you want to do. Uh, the 6100 uh, did not really have a lot of expandability. It's like the pizza box one, uh, like the extra large one. 7100, 8100, new bus. So if you have new bus peripherals, but you still want to use, let's say, System 7.1 for that slight bit of PowerPC native code, yeah, go for it, have fun. Um, but these machines uh, are, you know, Pretty common, uh, I would say if you get one, great, don't overpay for it because there are some excellent machines that came out afterwards that are PCI based and a lot faster. Right, and these are, if you notice, this case very much kind of looks like the Quadra 800, Quadra 800, 840 AV. It's because a lot of these early power PC designs were slightly modified Quadras to shoehorn in 68,000, yep, 68,000, uh, I'm sorry, Sorry, I screwed that up. <laughs> 68,000 boards shoehorning in PowerPC technology. Um, here is when we arrive <laughs> with some of these older machines. Um, if you're interested in the PowerPC era, definitely these PCI uh, Power Macintoshes will get you where you want to go. Yep. Um, these represent, um, they have uh, air DIMM memory. Unlike the older machines, you use 72 pin SIM, so you got it's much, much quicker memory access. Uh, they do use 5 volt versus a lot of 3.3 volt that you might find. So if you just go out and like, well, shucks, I'll just buy a PC 133 RAM, you're not going to get very far. Um, so you will have to find the, the special RAM that these machines kind of used. But the RAM access, very, very quick, PCI expandability. And then uh, you did have kind of the early machines, like the 7200, which was just basically uh, trying to get people in the door on yeah. it. And then you had 7500, which allowed for processor upgrades and things like that. But the, the base model is the Motorola 6, or 601 processor, the same that came in the last generation of PowerPC Macintoshes. But then Apple pumped the gas, and we've got 8500, the 8600, the 9500, um, and 9600, which have like 604 options tons of expandability. Um, some of these uh, models, I think like the 8600, 9600, you do have to sacrifice a PCI slot to having a video card, but they have like built-in ethernet and all yeah. that. And they'll run early ver earlier versions of uh, System 7 with some system enablers, but then they'll go all the way up to like System 9 on some of yeah, these. Yeah, you even show OS 10 on some of them with the upgrade. So very desirable machines if you are if you want any sort of uh, compatibility with other systems. Still have a built-in floppy drive on board. Uh, you have SCSI as the interface. You also have onboard networking. So very nice machines. Um, and yeah, there's a lot to choose from here. Right. Pricing wise on these, I've picked up 9600s for 75 bucks, just where somebody is just trying to unload it. Like they, they're like, oh, this was dad's machine. He had a desktop publishing business and he's passed on. So we want to make, uh, or we're just trying to clean up the attic or something. So you can get some of these even high-end machines pretty inexpensively. Don't waste money buying a low-end 601 and then trying to source a 604 processor later. Yeah. Buy the machine that you <laughs> want spec-wise out of the gate. Let somebody else have already paid that expensive new power or whatever upgrade chip for that machine. Uh, just try to get in at the level that you're wanting on these machines. Yep. And so uh, these, you know, we're not going to cover in tremendous detail, but 
So, some of these machines you could just say, nope, no thank you. Um, interesting, a lot to say about them. We don't have time. So uh, I would just say, unless they're free, I would suggest that if you're, it's your first foray into things, uh, you know, maybe skip it. The only one of these that I would say might be an exception would be the, like that 6200, shoot it directly into the sun. That's, <laughs> that's, that's like the Quadra 630, it's some of those other machines, it's IDE, it's very slow. This, it was a very compromised machine. The 6200 is like a Quadra 630, so like a 68000 or 68040 machine with a 603 processor shoehorned in. So you have, uh, Apple tried to stretch those motherboard designs as much as they could back in the day. Don't get me started. Ron. Yeah, but it's it's really a very poor performing machine. IDE does not yeah, help so it. So avoid. Avoid. Yeah, the 4400 is a neat one, but mm -hmm. you know, because it's basically the platform that Apple farmed out to other companies when they started working with people like Power Computing and all that to make their clone platform. So it's neat in that respect that it uses kind of PC case and PC power supply and stuff. But it's still kind of a compromised machine, but it is, it is kind of an interesting, like a novelty. Uh, and then you have the 603 uh, all-in-one Power Macintosh Popular machine. Popular in education. Yeah, yeah, these are beautiful, because I saw a lot of um, zombie models out there on the floor. Or what color? They kind of turns an orangey. <laughs> kind of, like, they're really sickly looking. It's like, check the liver on this machine. Again, uh, the boards come out the back, so you can right. get a good look at them. Yeah. So these were compromised machines from the start, because it was trying to create or have a cheap computer for education that filled that all-in-one sort of... Uh, like you know, thing, uh, but I, I wouldn't buy any of them. They're they're the they're heavy. power supplies were weak. <laughs> they're heavy. Uh, they are on an adjustable slidey base that is made of the exact same cheap plastic that's cracking all up on the back of the monitor. So it's like, hey, this looks amazing. You put it down on your desk. That will be the last time that machine moves until it goes to e-waste because you have just cracked and crushed all of the control mechanism underneath that for adjusting it. The next adjustment is going to be into your lap. All right, so uh, these are some of the more desirable machines, G3 Beige Desktop, um, a great backwards compatibility machine, a great bridge machine, Ethernet built in, ADB, PCI, you can put USB, FireWire in it, can run OS X, a lot of expandability. These are some of the most desirable Beige machines just because they are running a very fast processor and Apple didn't really skimp on them. So if you find one of these at a good price, um, all the way backwards compatible to early versions of, I think, uh, System 8 was the first one that shipped with it. I, th I think you can run 755. Oh, is, that, okay. is that true? 755. Uh, yep, yep. So that is, and that's kind of like the last version of kind of that System 7 before yeah. things really kind of kicked into high gear for PowerPC and all that. Yeah. So, yeah. Last you, of the old world ROM, as, as yes. you make her. So, yeah. And these, they're, they're great. They're perfect bridge machines, like yeah. uh, Steve said. Um, so there is a G3 blue and white, but we're not really kind of talking about that because that is part, kind of part of that new guard, new yeah. world runs. No, no that. old legacy ports, no right. serial ADP yeah. except. USB and all that, yeah. All right, palette cleanser. This was a lot of information. I'm, I'm exhausted. So Where are we? I just, I don't know. I, 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 this was a lot of information to absorb. I appreciate your patience. So uh, what do I do with all this knowledge, Steve? What do I do with all this? Well, you could write a book. Oh. oh, maybe I would figure out what machines I actually want to narrow this down and actually kind of collect. So Steve, you've picked three machines. I picked three machines. It's almost like we did homework for this. But we don't have a lot of time. So you could, you could look at these and go, huh, OK. And yeah. <laughs> so these are great machines uh, that Steve's kind of talked about, some uh, kind of like neat machines and stuff to kind of think about. Uh, like my, my machines, we, we kind of spoke, we spoke kindly about them earlier, so this should kind of uh, make sense. But this would be kind of our picks if you're trying to get, uh, kind of get the ball rolling on a collection. What machines should you avoid, Steve? These. Avoid these <laughs> machines. Uh, actually, the big thing at the bottom, we did speak really kindly about the Color Classic. I would not purchase one unless you are somebody that's looking to take on a basket case, because a lot of those machines have leaky caps, they've got analog board problems. So. All-in-one Macs, great, as long as they're not color. 
So what type of upgrades would you do? Well, uh, you know, the SCSI hard drive is probably one of the biggest things that you're going to come across. It's going to be dead. You're going to have trouble sourcing replacement. There are great things out there like the blue SCSI that will replace that with an SD card compatible little unit. Um, there are other flavors of these things online, RAS SCSI, et cetera, other projects. But uh, this is one of the, the ones I like, and it's great. It's easy to configure. You pop it in, you spend under $50, and you have a, a lifelong SCSI drive with tons of expandability options. And there's lots of folks that are also producing, because we talked about those fragile plastics. Uh, Joe from Joe's Computer Museum is now making uh, or printing replacements for some like dry bay doors, things like that, um, that, uh, that otherwise you can't source them. Uh, Silicon Insider, Drake, they're making replacement VRAM. They're make, they've got other cool projects and stuff that they're uh, working on. I know that Silicon Insider now has like a ROM replacement yep. where you can get past, you don't have to do that big long RAM test on your SC30. Uh, there, of course, there's cap kits. You can you can do a bomb out there on, uh, uh, you know, a they Mauser or something yeah. like that. But uh, Console Five has really great, like just preset cap kits, tandem caps. That's or, where I buy them from. They're cheaper there. Want. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, if you do have an older Mac that you need like an easy way to kind of load floppy disks, the floppy emu is probably a good uh, good purchase. You get that over at Big Mess of Wires. Uh, Raskazi is another um, virtual uh, hard drive emulator. This one also has uh, some Ethernet capabilities, and you can also maybe emulate SCSI video stuff. Uh, some of those things are kind of in their infancy, so you just have to kind of check those projects to see how they go. And, and we'll be sharing some of these links on Ron's Twitter, so don't worry if you, you lose a, a link or anything like that. Follow me, Mac84TV, or Ron at Ron's Comp Vids. And these links I will be it. posted. Yeah. And uh, everybody saw Mark with Mac Effects with the cool clear cases and stuff. So people are making all kinds of new stuff all the time for these. If you want to learn more about Apple and their history, definitely check out apple-history.com. Uh, if you want to connect with other experts and enthusiasts about uh, kind of these old machines. Including maybe, us. Yeah. Or maybe ask questions that we didn't cover here. Uh, definitely go over to tinkerdifferent.com. If you're looking for old abandoned wear Macintosh software, macintoshgarden.org is a great place to go. If you want to just hear cool stories about the old days of Apple and kind of the early days and maybe some things that were even covered in the Lisa talk earlier, definitely go over to folklore.org. And if you're just looking for machine specs or buying recommendations and kind of connecting with a community that kind of specializes in those things as well, lowendmac.com. Yeah, and everymac.com is also another great site. Find out the specs, you, you demystify what's in the machine, get a lot of help. Yeah. Uh, we did want to open things up for just a few minutes of questions. Um, I know that we are extremely limited on time here. We have another session that's going to start any second. Um, so what I would say is when those people come in, make sure that your rag with the ether on it is completely coated. <laughs> you place it around their mouth and then slowly lower them to the ground. And Do not will, let them drop. We can stand outside for questions afterwards Yes, as well. we'll definitely answer, answer questions after. Actually, that would probably be best if we did that. Yeah, I really, we'll do that what I really want to do is I really want to give something away. Okay? That's the only reason I come to these timeshares. <laughs> okay? You see this QR code? You guys familiar with QR get code? Get out your smartphones now. If you can't get the QR code from there, I have five copies of the paper. If some generous individual were to grab that and pass that around, they could probably do it. What you are going to do is you are going to go to this link on the Yep Tubs. You are going to enter in this comment, hashtag VCF. And as soon as everybody is ready, we are going to give away three items. I have a Macintosh 7200. I have an LC. And I also have a book. That's a really cool thing from the old days about building your own Mac. In the old days, they called it a cat. <laughs> I heard it. You can watch the video later. Yes. <laughs> so go ahead, and we'll give everybody 30 seconds or so so I can go ahead and get the other thing up. Does everybody have the QR code that's going to participate? Thumbs up? We good? OK. Great. If not, there are pages printed with the code there. Um, and we're going to run a little thingamajig. Yes. And we'll magically select somebody. Yes. A few people. And what do we do once we go When you go to the link, please enter in the comment, hashtag capital V, capital C, capital F. Yeah, so you want to make a comment on that video, hashtag capital Victor V, capital Charlie C, capital F. Trot. You already messed up. Hmm? The, the, oh, the code? Yeah. Uh, it's right there on a piece of paper five feet from you. OK. Does everybody have the QR code who intends we'll to participate? Give you we'll allow this seconds. gentleman. We'll 
allow this young person da, to go. Da, 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 da. Now, copyright we claims. Listen, we can't get a copyright strike at a convention. That Sorry. seems extra expensive. Sorry. Sorry. I would say make it look exactly like this so that way that there's no confusion. We don't make the tool, but they the tool They don't charge the tool. you to use the shift button, well, I promise. You might want to make a are, are we ready, folks? Let's, right, I'm going to go wait, through. Wait one hold second. on, hold on, y'all. <laughs> I am going to go through. We are going to use the website commentpicker.com, which is a great thing if you're going to run an online contest. We're going to see how many comments we've actually got here ready to go. Am I still on the wi the, the Wi-Fi's? You want my hotspot? Oh, hold on. Okay, 46 unique comments. Great job, guys. All right, are we ready? The last call for alcohol? All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna whoops, sorry. I'm gonna do this one more time. I just wanna absolutely make sure that we've got I hope I win. that intends to participate. Okay, here we go with our raffle. Now, what is this one for? Now, this one is, this is just gonna be choice. So you can come up, you can pick any of the three, okay? And whatever's left for the last person, it's like first prize is a Cadillac Eldorado, second prize, is, or second prize is steak knives, third prize, you're effing fired. So let's see <laughs> how it goes. I'll give you a handshake. Right. All right, here we go. Uh, oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> This, this, is, this is my sequel injection face. <laughs> All right, Eric, please come up and claim your prize. <laughs> okay. You want the book? The book is really cool. I love that book. When I, was, when I was young and I picked up a copy at Barnes & Noble, this was a thing called a bookstore. What is it? What's um, the book title? Yes, it's called uh, Build Your Own Macintosh and Save. It is archived on archive.org if you really want to read it. Yeah, it's a fun book. It's, 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 it's going to look amazing on your toilet tank. All right, here goes our second winner. Dustin Rondeau. Woo! Dustin, please come up and collect your prize, sir. Okay, here we go. Let's see, what are you going to pick? Bigger is better. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Perfect. Nicely done, kind sir. Okay, this is a straight LC. No, no, no. <laughs> but if you do shake it, it does make a sound. It was owned by uh, Carlos the Diamond Smuggler. Who knows what's in there? All right, here we go. Last winner of the evening. Mike. Mike. Hey. Hey. Wow. Now, Mike, I will tell you, uh, the machine needs RAM. Please reach out to me after the show. I'll be happy to send you some RAM for it, okay? But otherwise, it's mostly good. Don't breathe on the plastic. It will shatter. Everyone, <laughs> I want to say thank you so much for joining us this evening. Steve and I will, will be outside for Punch and Bars, and uh, we'll be happy to answer your questions up until one of us falls asleep. But the very last thing that I would like for you to do, would everybody please stand? I would like to go ahead and thank you for joining us this evening, and I want to take a picture of you, please. Our table is located outside. You'll see Ron's face. Yeah, so. I was going to say, come here. Yep. Oh, oh, we're going to do that thing like rich people do. Ah. Stay right here. Oh, God. Now turn around and face me. These guys look very soul. All right, hold on. I'll figure out how phones work. All right, over there. Hey, all right. Hey,